This, the wrath of George W. Bush, actually began in 2005. Uh, there was a show in Brussels of my work, and I made a sketch called exactly that, uh, a very, very rough sketch uh, based on uh, the Medusa by uh, Jericho, Wrath of Medusa, but with George Bush as the central figure. We built the set, we got this, these uh, old boards, all the people come from, all 17, uh, the people in one shot, this is totally analog, uh, and they're all from Albuquerque 15, except for the George Bush and the Barbara Bush, who come from a firm in uh, LA called Famous Lookalikes. And this guy was great. He's the uh, chief electrician in the Monterey Aquarium. And he's fabulous. So anyway, uh, what happens here is, let me just go back to the little sketch, is the fact that this was the, the central point of the whole composition, besides, of course, the reference of the Jericho. And um, uh, this particular model, uh, who is Congo Lisa Rice, by the way, Congo Lisa Rice, and she's a kind of a Calvinistic sex toy, that's how I pictured her. She's the same model, by the way, as Ritablo, and the same model as Night in a Small Town. I mean, she is the woman, and this is very, very interesting, uh, when I was doing the New York Times spread, I needed uh, a beautiful, beautiful body, a woman with a beautiful, beautiful body, to be the Venus de Milo. So she posed as Marguerite for the New York Times, and this was the, the second shot. And of course, uh, I, I put wax on her nose to make her more black looking. The same thing for her brother, by the way. This is a brother as, well, as uh, General Powell, uh, Secretary of State, who's tapping Georgie on the uh, shoulder. Uh, and the little ship here uh, is coming to save them. Uh, now, there was a painted ship, but actually, it's so finely painted that every print I make, I actually painted a little ship with my retouching uh, brush. But here uh, is a Mama Bush, uh, Barbara reflecting on, she's actually holding a reflector card. And uh, she's basking the son of the, uh, the greatest great great of the Republican Party. Uh, actually, the, the pose, it's almost as though he is on the cell phone. You know, that goes back to this thing about uh, talking to his dad, who is, of course, his father, A.G., was against the war from the beginning. So was I, always. And um, this is uh, Rumsfeld. You recognize his glasses here. He's defeated by the war. And uh, this is Cheney, a guy who is after winning at any price. And he's um, uh, dressed in drag, reminiscent of the men who dressed in drag to get off the Titanic. And there's his wife. Uh, and then this is a technocrat. Uh, kind of the guiding, uh, the guiding influence, we'll say, of that administration, the Bush administration. And um, it's great because I wanted to show the Christian and Jewish aspects, you know. Uh, and so this, he's either a blessing or getting a blowjob from a sailor. And there's the angel of death. The same model, by the way, uh, is the model in Night in a Small Town of the Pianist. And she's a, she's a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful, wonderful woman. I didn't have an outfit for her, so I made these, uh, my son sent me a pair of Japanese teacups, and I made the bra for her. This chap is a wonderful, wonderful uh, instructor. I know him from the gym in Albuquerque. Um, and of course, he and the, the rest of the people are actually the components of the, uh, the survivors, and were, everyone was guilty of cannibalism. And in fact, the story was repressed. It was written by two survivors. One eventually got published, and uh, then the whole thing blew up. And then from this disaster in 1816, Jericho did his greatest works. Huh? Uh, and that included the, the, uh, the paintings of severed heads and limbs, uh, even the, the work of uh, the insane people. So it's a very, very significant um, uh, painting. It's also, for me, it's one of my most significant photographs. And I think anyone who uh, buys this uh, print from me is getting a, a big chunk of my consciousness. And it worked out very, very well. The particular sketch for this
um, came about, uh, had a show in Moscow, I had two of that actually, two shows. And the second show I saw this woman in a beautiful, beautiful, I was always one at a time there soon, I don't know. And she was wearing this incredible fur coat and she was opening up and looking at my work and looking like this. And she had this t-shirt on with nothing underneath it except these two little, I don't know, we'll call them the tips of snow cones. It's like ice cream cones. She had these little beautiful, beautiful breasts. And uh, it was the last day of the show, so I couldn't know how to leave the next day anyway. And I said, oh, I'll do this thing, and maybe I'll do this thing in Paris. And it's kind of a tribute to the beauty uh, and the mystery of women's breasts. And um, I did this while a film crew was filming me. Uh, they've been working on this film in Paris for about three years now. Um, but I got this, this fedora, and I pushed it inside out, painted it white, and put these fish on and uh, every, everything else, the flowers and grapes and fruit. And then she uh, was working in, a, in, a, in Paris and I got to know her. She was an Israeli student and uh, was a very, very, very nice photographer, photographed herself. So I saw her photographs of herself and I can see her body. And I said, you're gonna be, you're gonna be perfect, you're gonna be perfect. And um, so I put this together Actually, at the Cité des Arts in Paris, where I, this little studio I stay, it's only thirty dollars uh, a day in Paris. I love it. I stay there for years and years and years when I can. And uh, so, what it is is that I just wanted to create this kind of strangely beautiful kind of components around her very very beautiful face, and then a detail which actually kind of balances the whole thing: uh, her breasts. And it's a very, very, uh, very gentle uh, photograph. Actually, this uh, kind of thing of it is more like me than a lot of my work. Then, um, because I always like to deal in in kind of harsher, um, almost macabre subject matter. But in the relationship to the subject matter I'm working with, I change because I'm, I'm based on the vehicle of making these things. Up. Of this bad student, and when it happened, the impetus for this was I got this mannequin at a flea market, and then I was making this shot in Eastern Europe, and uh, I wanted I, my idea was to keep this incredible mannequin, uh, 19th century, mid 19th century, I think it was, and uh, but in the other room, um, I had this ready with me for, for working, and I saw the severed head of this old lady. And I got the idea, I went back that night, made some sketches I normally do, and figured out that if I got a wig for the lady, uh, she would look more like a kind of a little girl and like a student, and that, that's how it came about in the drawing. And so it took a couple of days to get the, the wig, and I was working with this uh, makeup uh, person who does my uh, hair too. And uh, I put this up, the blackboard was there. The structure of the blackboard was, uh, I, I think, uh, notes of a doctor about the uh, joints of the knees, I think. But the great thing is that I took the mannequin off the stand and just placed it against the shoulder, the left shoulder against the blackboard, and it stood there without the head, and then I put the head on with the uh, uh, wig, and it was perfect, it was just perfect. Uh, and I, it was just a question of using, utilizing the early morning light, a very, very raking light, we'll say. <laughs> raking light. And then uh, using a fill. And um, actually, this was early on in this whole group of work, so that uh, originally I had made the print with uh, printing through glass. That's how these shapes are made. A lot of this stuff is made. But uh, I figured out later that if I would make. Um, these shapes were made in a very, very simple way with a uh, triple zero brush and some pigment for spotting prints. But if you put it down and let it dry a certain way, it'll make these really beautiful, beautiful spots. And that didn't happen before. So I negated uh, the other print I'd make. I made before this, and, and this is the, the replacement. I've never done this before, but it, it's an ongoing process of discovery. And in, in this uh, sense, too, I made these spots. The, the spots on this glass took me two days. And uh, uh, it, one thing, as far as Kathy's writing, which I love, 
she said, it's not that I make the photograph so much as like I print it, as, as basically build it. And basically this is a real reference to building the photograph because I think I've gone through about maybe three or four hours of different shapes here until I liked this one. Uh, and it all has to be perfect, perfect, perfect. In fact, I have in my work negated a print if I don't have enough tone right over there. That to me is, is the, the big difference. It has to be perfect. And uh, so bad student is not only about uh, say, the lack of passion in Western society as far as education, uh, but it's about how information is, is gotten and then, of course, given before that. And uh, normally it's not given right. It's not given clearly. And uh, I love this. I love this photograph. I love it. I love it. I don't, uh, I don't release anything unless it's perfect. And I love this photograph. Love it. This photograph is a kind of like a, a, an icon for me about um, uh, if there was a portrait of homosexuality, this would be my portrait of homosexuality. Okay? And um, these men are straight, not that that matters uh, in this case, but this guy is a composer of classical music and he is the lover of the woman in Paris who does makeup and hair for me. And I worked with him for years, but I never met him, but I did meet him socially. And he was perfect. I had to basically uh, build a photograph around him. Because you don't see this kind of person. This person could be like, uh, like Beauty and the Beast. He could have been Beast, you know, and uh, without the makeup. And he's wearing his own hair. Uh, his best friend is an acrobat. And this guy really had a, a terrific body and a terrific ass. That's very important because I, I mentioned that I, years before I bought this very, very uh, slinky type dress. And I said, it would be great if I can photograph a prostitute or something like that and have a hole made in the bag. And um, as it turned out, I, I went back to Paris with the dress and uh, in Albuquerque had another one made. We couldn't actually uh, make the exact fabric, but it was close enough. And there's a third person in here. This is a woman's hand who was the translator for me in this shot. And uh, you know, I went out and I could have bought a cheap lipstick, but no, I had to buy the most expensive lipsticks. <laughs> and so uh, he's wearing the lipstick because she applied it. And um, uh, for me, it's this kind of uh, interior kind of reflection. And most people, when they see this, their first impression is, well, is that the same guy reflected, you know? And it basically, it, it argues the, uh, I guess, a discipline to look at the work to see what's there. And actually, it is, it is a reflection, uh, for sure, of, of two consciousnesses, uh, two people posing, perhaps as gay men, posing as un-gay men, I don't know. But it's this, this uh, connection between uh, what we are and what we become as far as a dialogue with other people. In this case, what happened is that I came across this incredible book of um, retablos from Mexico. And retablos are very, very important. Um, as far as Mexico especially, outside of Mexico they usually call ex votos. But uh, in this case, it was a contemporary book of retablos. And a retablo is uh, a prayer, an answered prayer, and the person who makes up the prayer, whose life is involved in, in praying to the saint or requesting something from the saint, in this case Saint Sebastian, goes to a retablito in Mexico, and that's a painter. And the painter hears the story and then makes this, this painting. And normally they're on tin, normally they're very, very simple. And, uh, but what, what got me is the fact that this was a, a chapter in the book of homosexual prayers. Now, in, in, in strict Catholic uh, religion, or it's, not, well, it's about accidents, it's about uh, not being uh, hurt if you're just thrown off a building, things like that. 
uh, but it's never, 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 not until this time, uh, uh, prayers that homosexuals, uh, because of their own lives, are involved here. In this case, it's Sylvia M., which is the abbreviated name on the Rich Apple Prayer. And she is asking uh, Saint Sebastian, who's the same model, right? opposed to Saint Sebastian, uh, with the uh, uh, male genital, um, to basically, uh, the prayer is that Veronica is her lover and they're living together uh, and they're at peace, they're not being bugged. And so uh, I just don't make it that way. Uh, it, it happened that she, this woman's a professor of art in a very, very famous uh, Southern University and got email from her saying, I love your work, I want you to photograph me and by the way, I don't have uh, legs or hands. I said, well, that's interesting. Send me some pictures of yourself. And she did and she was fantastic. So um, I sent her a little sketch uh, by fax, and she said, oh, this sounds very, very good. And uh, it took about a month, I think, to basically uh, paint the Duccio driving out the devil. And it's all about the, uh, you know, what do you want? You want the spiritual paradise, or you want the world. And in this case, the world is uh, different degrees, the different kinds of architecture, especially uh, 13th century uh, Sienese architecture is involved here, but also the Twin Towers and, and uh, that all that kind of disaster uh, that we were going through and still are. And then, of course, I made everything more complex as I do. Uh, I made this, this kind of sculptural uh, bench with a Chardin. It's a, a Fontaine de Tour. Uh, vase and um, uh, this I had in my studio. I had things like that in my studio all the time. I could like them, and uh, the whole thing just was terrific. Just was terrific. Uh, I didn't know the pose for her. I knew that she was going to crown this person, and this person was very very thin. She came to Albuquerque, and I put them up at a hotel. She and her boyfriend have since married, and uh, uh, she had this little wheelchair, and she didn't have. Um, artificial legs. What she had is she had these legs made out of uh, crocheted fabric with toe shoes. It was great. And of course she couldn't, she had to be carried around. And uh, it was fantastic. So she came to the studio, had her made up, and this woman was made up too. Um, and I had spent time in India years ago. I lived there for five months and I remember this particular kinds of, of poses in, in uh, especially the erotic Indian in sculpture as, as, as in, in Kajarao. And this model is so attuned to things. I said, just give me this, just give me this. And she gives me this kind of great sculpture. Uh, just, she has a great body, a great body. And uh, she's, she's beyond fantastic because she is the same woman again in the Bathurst photograph wearing that little body stocking that's about this long <laughs> before it goes on the body. And uh, she represents a, a nice reprieve from a lot of my work because she is very, has a very, very beautiful body to begin with. And uh, in this case too she looks a bit like Ingrid Bergman. Uh, but she's very, very funny. Uh, we made these broken arrows, we put bit of blood in, uh, and it becomes a kind of an illumination. Of course, the, um, the prayer is here. It's, it's copied from the book. I should have Sylvia M, but we left just Sylvia, make it more uh, mystical. This is a, a kind, as it, all my work, it's about a moral consideration and concern of being human and enjoying to the full the human capacity. What happened here is that uh, I was approached in Paris by a couple from Milan, and they have a gallery in Milan. And uh, they were very nice. Uh, and when I saw her, I was just knocked out because I, I haven't seen a woman this incredibly beautiful and look very Italian, incredibly Italian. And uh, I accepted the show on the, on the caveat that I have, uh, that I photograph her. And uh, she said yes, he said yes. And um, so the next time I was back in Paris, I photographed her. And I got this at the flea market in Paris, this 20s crown. And uh, she's just a very, very lovely, beautiful uh, person. 
And I work with, again, the hairstylist who's the, uh, the lover of the guy in the photograph, now reflected. And uh, I shot the six by seven. I love that camera because I can see directly through it. And um, I made sketches of this and I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew where her body was supposed to be, where this wood was. Uh, this, came, come from a, 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 this came from a bill at the flea market too. I, I buy these old um, letters and bills and sometimes I just cut them up and, and make these very, very uh, strange um, lettered mysterious forms and um, I picked up that morning before the shot I picked up uh, branches and leaves and the rest is done very very critically and slowly uh, framed through glass and she is just a, a quintessential beautiful woman and um, the name uh, La Giovanissa means uh, a woman in her prime and uh, I, I guess she is. Uh, this is the same woman photographed in another country. Uh, but in this case, it's about uh, Ar it's Ars Moriendi or The Good Death. And uh, the great thing about this is the fact that I wanted to pose her this way. I had gotten a mirror, uh, I borrowed the mirror. Um, and I knew that this particular hospital had these severed heads. But I didn't know, I've never seen them, so I said, uh, to the guy I worked with, I said, well, bring out the heads. Bring out the heads. We basically had her in, in a form. I had this background. I had painted in Albuquerque, if were with me. Uh, this all came from locations. And when we brought out the heads, the stench was incredible. Incredible. These things must be, I don't know, uh, 10 years old at least. And medical students go back and, and take parts out or whatever. Um, I had to spray the air. Luckily, there was some uh, some of this uh, spray that you have in, in toilets, you know, to repress this odorificness. And uh, she was almost ready to faint. And I only took about three or four photographs. It was great. It was great. It was great. And the thing is, this I put the heads on. I, I put gloves on, um, examination gloves. I put the heads down, and then this one. And this one kind of looks like her too. I can see her. This is this old lady. And maybe she'll look like that. Maybe, in fact, she'll be the head of some other photographer's book in the future. But uh, I love this one. I love it. It's elegant. Uh, there's no such thing as a good death, I don't think. Uh, and it, unless you're uh, totally insane, uh, a healthy person, an old person, fears death. Because uh, there's the cutoff. There's the end of the exposure of life. I spent three weeks in Bogota. Uh, I was robbed. <laughs> it's, it comes, it's better than, than being kidnapped. That's a bad way to learn Spanish. But um, here, it started off too. This is actually a, a page from that book of Retablos. And the Retablo prayer is actually uh, hand printed here. And basically, what it is is that it's a, a person who was uh, chided and and suffered a great deal, and, and she wanted to be a physical woman. In this case, I'm not using a post-op, I'm using a real woman, a model. But she was incredible, she was just incredible. Uh, what happened is that I was photographing in Bogota in the studio, and the floor was just jumping around. It's a very old building, uh, early, early 18th century building. And I got trees. We put the trees up, I borrowed this uh, skull, I had the wig, had to rent the, um, the bed and the furnishes. Uh, furnishes. I, I brought this ET with me, I got this in Albuquerque year, years ago. I knew how to uh, make that work for me, that is represented here. Originally, I had a rhino head made there, but uh, we actually, this, because of uh, computer uh, working, I work with my collaborator, uh, who's a compositor, and he actually took a real rhino head and put it there. And it's so per perfect. I mean, this is not Photoshop. This is like the difference between Photoshop and, and some of the things in Hollywood. 
it's just brilliant the way he can do this. And so I sit there and I say, well, I like the scale, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we angle this, this uh, candle. And basically, we, we gathered, he put roots in the trees. And this, for me, starting actually with Night in a Small Town, um, as far as that collaboration, it's very important because it extends what I want to do in the photograph, but I can't do. But I can't do. Um, and now I can. And the fact is that she had these lights around her, but the lights didn't work when I was in Boca Jaw. So we made them work afterwards. I went ahead and photographed her. And I said to myself, wait, she won't move the lights in. And I can tell this guy, I want this kind of light. I show him the reproduction. He finds it for me. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. But uh, the print itself, uh, for me, represents the kind of uh, integration between sensuality and, and sanctity that all of us, regardless of what we believe in, I think perceive. And uh, uh, it's called the scale because uh, this scratching is a reversal of a Philip Gustin drawing uh, called the scale. And when I get the scan negative, which is an 8 by 10 negative, and I have an 8 by 10 larger uh, for this purpose, uh, I only have one, I have to wait two weeks for that negative to come. Incredibly expensive. And I said to myself, I'm going to put this drawing on this negative. So I turned the negative around in my light box, and I actually took any number of, of different tools, uh, scalpel, screwdriver, a needle, and part of a razor blade I have broken off. And I made this drawing, and it was perfect. It's like a kind of a, a, a primal uh, graphic entity. And everything worked. I mean, this could have gone in the face, it didn't. You know, it was perfect. Everything was perfect. It's like it's like kind of a given thing that happens, and I'm very, uh, very, very proud of this. This is a great one. I can only make one of these a day. That's how tough it is to make. This is history of the White World Arabia, and uh, it's my reaction. I think. Artists should be social critics, for sure, and I think unavoidably they, they, they are, if the work is any good. Uh, but this gets into it for me because what I wanted to do is to show the impossibility. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East myself. I've been to Beirut, spent time in Israel, uh, traveled around a great deal. These people don't think the way we think. Uh, it's very, very tribal. It's, it's, uh, they have a different kind of parameter as far as how they investigate or think about problems. <clears throat> it's almost biblical. And it ain't gonna happen that we can basically go in there as dumb, stupid soldiers, uh, knowing the language, not knowing the culture, and trying to bring peace when they should just be left alone. And, um, and so this, was, uh, this is, is a kind of a metaphor of this kind of non-dialogue this impossibility of, of uh, any, any kind of discourse between the history of them and our ridiculously short and, and uh, insipid uh, sense of what we're going to do as far as spreading democracy. And um, this particular woman was born with this kind of wraparound twisted hand. The other one's OK. Uh, but she's holding this uh, skeleton uh, hand and the flower. And this was very, very complex to do, very, very complex. It started off with this tapestry, which was in our guest house in Albuquerque. And then I had, I chose the fabric and had this whole outfit made uh, for her. And uh, the face was retouched in the old, old fashioned way. Not with a computer, but with this old kind of disc, you know, and it's a very, very kind of 30s and 40s stylization. And I just loved it. It was the last thing this woman did for me before she moved out of Albuquerque. Not this woman, the model, but the woman, the retoucher. And uh, I thought this was a very, 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 very kind of uh, almost Victorian way of photographing, but it, it is as contemporary as anything else, except that just the uh, connection between the 
um, the, the forms, the, the period look of the things, I guess what energy she brings to it too. She's very, very uh, gentle and yet very, very strong, yet very, very beautiful a photograph of a problem that uh, is still with us. And as I say on the uh, statement that uh, this particular situation, this war, uh, has basically ruined the soul of this country. And I hope, uh, I hope we don't elect McCain. I hope to God we don't do that. The story here was that I had this idea that I wanted to photograph a, an aristocrat. And you can do that in Paris, at least the people, some of the people I know. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, about three or four Paris photos back, I was introduced to a woman who was related to Joan of Arc. I said, oh, this, only in France could this happen. Very wonderful woman, very, very elegant. Very elegant. This, is not, this is not her. But um, what had happened is that you, know, you can't recognize this dog, but this particular dog, this white dog, is the same dog as in first casting for, for Mila. Huh? Because the writer knows this smart woman. She knows everybody. That's how I was able to photograph a lot of celebrities too in Paris, including uh, Isabel. And uh, so anyway, what happened is that this woman came to the gallery in Paris and uh, she knew my work, but she wanted to meet me. And she saw me, and she said, okay, you can photograph me. I said, well, what, what made the difference? And she said, well, I, you know, I didn't know what to expect, but I, I, I see that you're a, a, a regular person. I said, okay, we're, we're fine. But I said, uh, then I showed her the uh, sketch, and I said, well, this regular person is going to like uh, take a chemise, uh, they do it in, in really, uh, uh, classical uh, dressmaking. You wear this kind of uh, gown of cotton, and then you could work on that as the maquette or the, the, the form of the, the final gown or the dress. And uh, this is also filmed, so they film me. Uh, she was nude under this thing, the chemise, and I, I cut the holes and I cut them out with the scissors, which I was sweating. And then I had to cut the hole for her legs and her pubic hair, but we moved that down for the photograph. And um, I photographed this in, in an apartment in Paris. Uh, and this was a, this family member is is uh, real. Uh, the people had the apartment. This is one of their uh, ancestors. And of course, it's based on a painting by um, Veggie Brom. La Brom. And uh, she was a very, very close friend of Marie Antoinette. And she created about 600 portraits, uh, sometimes of herself, but most of other people, aristocrats. And uh, during the shot, I posed the dog. I, I painted this background. I lit it while the film guys were filming. I went out and got these taxidermy of a cat and a bird. And uh, there's a, actually a person behind her stretching out this form because uh, I really wanted that shape. The photograph didn't take long. I shot this six by seven, you know, which is not a, a large negative at all. Uh, but I really wanted to see every, every mile of detail, especially the lighting. And I couldn't do that safely with a regular four by five because the difference between what you're looking at and what the camera lens is seeing is, is totally different. So how to use this camera. And uh, I shot one roll of film, I got it. I got it. And uh, afterwards, of course, the film crew being French, they interviewed her for an hour and was found out with a little French I did know the fact that she wanted to have me photograph her. And of course, she got a gift card for this payment uh, because she basically had a handle on her alcohol. So, this is kind of nice too. See? And uh, so, what she has then, uh, what we all have, I guess, is, is an image of a, a kind of a victory. Uh, hers over that addiction and mine over the problem of being a problem. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first shot actually I did in the same location uh, in Bogota and I wanted a pre-op uh, transsexual and through my 
translator there, a guy named Karim, who I met uh, one time before, because I had a show in Bogota. Um, he knew of a few gay guys who possibly would know a pre-op. And it just so happened that the night before, they went out dancing, and they met this pre-op. And so I was able to, to meet her, and I said, she's astounding. And in fact, she didn't take off her clothes. Only, I, I saw her without clothes on, only just uh, in the shop when she was being made up. And she has this, whoever made these breasts, I don't know, I, I think they used it to use that 59 Cadillac bumper. I think they're under there as far as structure. I think those are the armatures. <laughs> And the crazy thing is, is the fact that her middle finger, something must have happened to the finger, you may have noticed this, because it's very, very phallic, and uh, we didn't touch that. I only used the compositing uh, to basically clean up some hair, and uh, we made this solarization happen, which is fantastic. And uh, these prints were at this, the School of Art, and they were, um, made by an American photographer in the 30s or 40s. No one really knew. And it's something to do with a dictator. And no one knew his name, but I said, I saw him, I said, I want to use these in the photograph. And, uh, you know, this is shot four by five, so it's razor sharp. And uh, I had this background painted. And this background uh, represented this kind of a, a kind of a freak show of life, if you would. And it's about an age uh, wherein I read a lot of, um, books on phenomenology, uh, theology, and aspects of uh, future times from, from secular and, and religious writers. And supposedly in the Catholic Church there's a time of purification. There's a time when uh, the religious will be the servants of, of different people. So in my case what I wanted to do is, is uh, create a time where um, uh, pre-op transsexuals are in power. <laughs> and religious are their servants. And um, so this is a prom photograph of a, of a person who's basically just finishing high school. And uh, I think it, it really balances on, on an aspect of, of kind of horror and fun uh, at the same time. Because I really like projecting something in the future. Because I think we all do that, somehow. But especially in this case, I really enjoyed uh, the possibility. If I didn't have this person, I, could have, I wouldn't have done this photograph. I would have done this photograph with the background of somebody else. Uh, it's based on this particular uh, maquette and model. And I started this in Albuquerque and, and kept refining it in Bogota, add to it. And so this is a, a kind of map or atlas for the resulting photograph. This. This, yeah, um, everything is a form of discovery. And, and when I, of course, I make uh, process the film to the contact prints, choose the best negative, and, and I said to myself, well, you know, I just can't have all this uh, extra stuff around. I basically want to create this first, this kind of coffin shape. Then I made this slightly different, um, and then I wanted to use the retablo prayer. And I basically designed this. It took me several hours to design this whole thing. And it took me a, a while to design it right into the proportions on the easel as I'm printing. But it's very, very important to me. It, the, the work tells me what to do. And that's, that's part of the dialogue you create. And I really like this. In fact, I really like the way this uh, was, was uh, matted. It's perfect. This was actually a photograph, an entire photograph that could have been, I could have editioned this the way it is as a collage, but I didn't because uh, I really wanted to make it one of a kind. And um, what it is is that the title says it all, as they say, but it's um, Arbus on e hop and Bacon on DK. Muy picante, or Picasso cante. And of course I was hearing Spanish for three weeks uh, through my head. And what happened is that I photographed this to basically receive that information. I photographed the woman on the bed, I photographed the frame, I photographed the guy smoking a cigarette, uh, which if you, in your mind, if you reverse him, 
It's Hopper's painting of a couple in a, a hotel near a railroad. And uh, he's smoking a cigarette. But put, I put the hair curls in him, which of course is Arbus. One of the great uh, portraits of Arbus. And uh, the bacon, of course, uh, it is related to uh, the power of the association of de Kooning. And uh, I don't even mention, I don't even mention uh, Pollock in the front and more Picasso well, later on. But uh, the woman on the bed there, originally nude, is just, just you can just see her eye. And basically, it, it's about the anxiety of uh, the times we're living in and how that anxiety is related to as far as the, the, the visual history of, of the time we're living in. And uh, she's kind of cowering behind the image or the icon of a woman that's both Bacon and de Kooning at the same time. And I think it's just a, a, a perfect little thing, but it's a lot of little things. This particular image, Night in a Small Town, the reference, the beginning of this, is that fact I love Edward Hopper. The fact that I was living in the village in 1967 when he died, and I, 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 I was only living about six blocks away from where he lived in Washington Square Park. And, but I didn't know he lived there. I thought he lived in Nyack, where he was born. And, uh, but I've always loved his work. Every time I come to Chicago, what I do the first day after I come here, I go to Art Institute to see the, uh, uh, the Great Painting, Nine Walks. And uh, this area comes from a uh, room, room in New York City. And it's a couple, he's at the table, and she's kind of playing the piano, the, the piano they're totally bored, totally kind of uh, solitary. Um, and there's a door there too, there's a kind of uh, painting on the wall. And that was the starting point. Uh, I started with the door, and we actually, I got this from a catalog of taxidermy specimens. And of course, we cut the, the head off, and I knew this was the, the beginning of working with some aspects of, of digital retouching, because I knew there was no way, Jose, that I was going to put this woman in here without having to, to basically have it retouched. And um, as we were painting this, it took about two weeks to paint this, otherwise it was a um, I got in touch with uh, different people, and I, I got in touch with this very, very wonderful uh, digital um, uh, worker who I'm still working with. He's fantastic. And uh, we put her three times she came for fittings because, of course, she's standing here on a, on a, a base. And I photographed her standing there, and I photographed her without being there. For, you know, for the, and uh, we put this out of focus. This was painted and put in front. This is one of our Navajo carpets. Uh, this door, I was ex starting to explain, this is a regular door. Then I, I knew that it was this high. We, this is a trump loy on top. It was a regular door for the trump loy uh, door and it was a real frame. Uh, I bought this painting in Valencia for one euro. Love it. I rented this one. She's the same woman in Reverend George Bush as the angel of death. She actually plays the piano, has a collection of 30s and 40s and 50s dresses. And um, uh, when this was first shown, a man seeing the show came up to me and says, oh, I can read the music. It's Albignoni. Okay. That, that was very important to me. So I chose Albignoni for the photograph. And, um, but what this is about is the fact, obviously, this is the muse of this artist uh, who's basically checking out her work. And I love the fact that uh, in, in Hopper, very often the, the nudes, some of the, the men too are smoking cigarettes. This is kind of a common thing at the time. And uh, so she's smoking the cigarette, and it took us really a long time to get that, that smoke of the stroller. And uh, I really love this photograph. It's very, very delicate. Uh, it's, it's very accessible. It's um, one of the photographs of mine that you can see in the morning over Cheerios. Uh, this particular maquette for it, actually this is the same model from Retablo with the painting of Retablo in the background. And I came across this and I started drawing the horse shape and uh, made the cigarette 
position possible. I love do doing these things on, on uh, Polaroids. And then, so this became uh, the Mac Patch board, this particular one of two of them, actually, uh, for this image. And uh, it was the first time I actually uh, dealt with a uh, digital um, change in the work. But what I do get after we make the changes is I get an 8 by 10 negative. So the work itself is always analog. That doesn't change. And so that basically keeps, the, for me, the, the purity. Uh, and basically, as I said before, it basically keeps um, information available and a way to approach the work to make it as, as emotional and perfect as, as possible. this idea, uh, what I wanted to do is, I had some knowledge already working on with the uh, digital collaborator, and I had this notion of making a portrait of Balthus uh, as a kind of manifestation, not, not showing Balthus, but showing his work and maybe his history. Uh, and it started off with the, the model, uh, Catalina Parrish, her name is. Uh, and I, I found this bodysuit in Albuquerque at uh, a place that sells party gear and clothes, you know. Still it was like this, whatever. And it, it turned out that the whole suit was like this. And I said, well, is it one size fits all? And I said, this woman is big. She said, it's going to fit. It's going to fit. So I was afraid she was really going to stretch the whole thing out, so I had made up. And uh, then when she put it on, I, I was working with two hairstylists cut my hair and have a shop in, in Santa Fe, uh, two gay guys, and they couldn't get over her body. I mean, I, uh, after the, uh, the guy saw her, the older guy, I thought it was going to be converted. I mean, it was getting close. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she's holding this vase, which I had made in Albuquerque. Right? And uh, we drilled the holes out before that. And I try to get this water that you can photograph with stroke, but no. Couldn't do it. This was drawn in by the compositor. I rented this chair. This is one of our cats, and it took this. Of course, it's called the King of Cats. So this is this is Baltus. And uh, the relationship with the Mona Lisa. This is the Mona Lisa on top, and the model's face below. So there's a fusion. And if you can compare this with the actual Mona Lisa, you can see the change. And it's very very human. It's very very nice. But uh, Barbara had to give this cat an injection. One of our cats called Pancake, because the face is big like a pancake. <laughs> and it just about killed her. I think she, she aged about five years. And uh, this is a model, one of my uh, painters, uh, and she's posed as one of Balthus's works called The Awakening. And uh, so there's this connection between the classical to the, uh, to the very, very real, as far as the, the uh, Balthus's love of the ingenue, the young girl, the young beautiful girl. Uh, who I wrote about this, is that she's somewhere between uh, thumb sucking and uh, uh, illicit sex. And then this is from Lao Wu, uh, one of Balthus's great, great paintings. And um, he's a painter. Uh, but actually, I always saw this painter in the description of Balthus, he calls this the carpenter. And uh, so you don't see his face, you see Picasso, one of Picasso's works here. I, I made that print, put it on uh, the wood, because for me, uh, Picasso has never painted something as profound and, and raw, now there is bacon, as uh, Balthus is the uh, guitar lesson. And so I made Picasso a cripple, because mentally and, and emotionally it was a cripple not doing that in my book. And then I joined this for the other photograph, this is one photograph, this is the second, of uh, the great, great portrait of uh, uh, Juan Miro and his daughter Dolores. And uh, this is a guy, uh, a Latino man who, who fixes our engines, you know, the tractors and cars. And, uh, and then this is a, a girl, a very small little girl from Vienna who is visiting. And uh, my painter painted this dress. I said, how are we gonna make this dress? So I'll just paint it on paper. And she painted on paper, right from the painting. And it worked out great. 
And uh, when I get the negative again, uh, the scan negative, put it in my eight by 10, uh, I make a contract and then I scratch. I, I do everything I, I have to do. And uh, I, this, this print is just so very elegant and um, risky, and I really love it. This is called Life is an Invention, Baldus. This is called Canada's Camera, <clears throat> and the beginning point for this, besides being the retablo from that book, was uh, Bernard's great personal photographs. They've been uh, reproduced very often, but Bernard loved photography, especially when he was using those cameras that were very, very uh, handmade, that were very optically, uh, very um, problematic. And in one of his photographs, you have this, this huge uh, shape, looks like a, a lens. And actually, the collaborator actually drew this in, drew that in. And um, I photographed this at, at the University Park uh, in Bogota. And uh, she was the same model as the model in the little um, collage. Uh, and she looked like a, a Degas. I wrote this, but I just had it to translate into Spanish. I wrote my own kind of retablo. And basically, it's about this tree. This tree uh, talk, it talks about the fact that at night, once in the change of seasons, he had seen Degas talk to a woman dressed only in gloves, black gloves. And so that's why they're represented that way. Occasionally, just for nature alone, not, not for humankind, but the ascension takes place. So I got this model. And originally, I chose this guy. It took me about uh, four days to choose this guy with a very beautiful face. But what I did is that I didn't want to show the face because it, it's, it's not mysterious. So uh, every time I make this print, it takes me about 15 minutes to expose it. And then by the time I get to the, the, the phase, another seven minutes or so after I process it, uh, after it's hypoed, I have to bleach this. If I bleach it too much, I blow it. So uh, I generally have to make one print of every four works just to see enough face. Um, and what it, it tells is that she, the Degas, in a very contemporary way, is like Magdalene uh, trying to touch Christ dressed as a gardener uh, after the um, resurrection. And um, this is actually two pieces of sculpture that we had put together with a lot of hardware that was covered with this, this form. And this wasn't the face of the original model. He actually drew this face. He drew the, the, the uh, lines over a woman that we photographed. Uh, a very, very beautiful woman. I'll be photographing her in the future too. And this is a Belmar I took with me. Um, and I got the, the frame in, in Bogota for it. And uh, the whole thing is a very, very, um, for me, this and the scale, uh, and, and also I, sh I should say that the other two images from Bogota represent uh, something that is, there's a reference there that doesn't come immediately from the camera. And that's what I like about this work. Uh, it's something that is, is studied, it's, very, it's felt very, very deeply, it's, it's presented in a way that you don't know if it's camera generated or not. But that doesn't matter because it's the experience and hopefully the, the profundity of the change of, of reality from what a person is viewing to what they're getting from the image that basically is about history and belief and, and confrontation through photography.